Freedom! 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 was a visionary, a revolutionary, and a pathbreaker. He dared to challenge colonial subjects and the colonial powers so that ordinary African people could organize for their independence. At long last, the battle has ended. He had a vision, he had a dream about Ghana. He broke with the past of bourgeois, uh, gradualist, nationalist politicians. We dedicate ourselves not only in the struggle to emancipate other territories in Africa. Our independence is meaningless unless it links up the total repression of the African continent. Kwame Nkrumah was the greatest pan-Africanist and socialist revolutionary organizer that the African world has seen. And if the masses of the people pick up on his ideas, Africa will be free. Kwame was born 21st September 1909 in a town called Ngrofu in the western region of Ghana. Kwame Nkrumah grew up in a colony ruled by the British. There was a governor general and there was a legislative council dominated by colonial commercial interests. The country existed for the export of raw materials that would serve the industries and economies of European nations. He was born to parents who were not particularly endowed in terms of their wealth. The father was a goldsmith and the mother was a petty trader. He is slightly difficult to pin down. He's, he's an Nzima. His dad comes from the Ivory Coast. His mother comes from just the right side of the Ghanaian border. So he's genuinely on the periphery in ethnic terms. He's on the periphery in class terms. He's on the periphery in that he's Catholic. Experiences of a child growing up in a family such as this one, in the colonial era, where the exploitation, the vast exploitation, was done by capitalists from the metropolis, and where citizens were looked down upon in their own surroundings, must have affected him very greatly. His mother, Nayaniba, who he was particularly very close to, um, was very keen um, for Nkrumah to receive an education. He also grew up at a time when um, the Christian churches were trying to make headway there. Almost all the schools that you could attend at that time, and I'm talking of primary schools that were in the beginning, no high schools, were church-run. Nkrumah was a highly affable young man with both his peers and his tutors. However, he was a very serious student, he was very studious, diligent, had a voracious love of, of reading, and one of his contemporaries by the name of Beverly Carter said that he always used to remember Nkrumah um, forever reading, engaging in philosophy, and debating with um, fellow colleagues. He was hungry for knowledge, he was searching for knowledge, he was desperately in search of, of knowledge which was necessary at the time if we were to combat the negative effect of colonialism and racism. Within the, the, the Gold Coast and generally West Africa, um, from the latter quarter of the 19th century, the minority of educated West Africans were pushing and mobilizing, galvanizing for political independence. I think that Kwame Nkrumah was influenced by a number of very important people as he was growing up in, in Ghana. There were people like James Iman Kwejir Agri. Nkrumah says of him in his autobiography that he was a most remarkable man, a man with, um, who possessed um, intense vitality and enthusiasm. And it was through Agri, Nkrumah narrates in his autobiography, that his nationalism was aroused. In a way, Agri mirrored, you know, the kind of person Nkrumah wanted to be. He often said, 
I represent Africa. I've never heard of Agri saying, I represent the Gold Coast. He always said, I represent Africa. Even though Nkrumah was not taught formally by Agri, he used to visit Agri at church and listen to his Sunday evening sermons. And it was through his sermons that Nkrumah was profoundly inspired in terms of his commitment and convictions towards Pan-Africanism. The last person was Nandi Azikwe, popularly and affectionately referred to as Zeke. He's one of Nigeria's great nationalists and he was a publisher. He had been a graduate of Lincoln and as a result um, influenced Nkrumah to go and study abroad. The challenge for Nkrumah to get to the United States of America was basically mainly financial. He didn't have the money. He stowed away on a boat to get to a relative in Nigeria who was quite wealthy because he thought the relative would help. That entailed many risks. Of course, when stowaways are discovered on ships, they kill them and throw them overboard. So it was a big risk that he took. The relative paid for him to go back to the Gold Coast to pick up all his gear and to make final arrangements, paid for him to come to England and paid for his passage to America. The social climate and atmosphere in America during the 40s was just like apartheid in South Africa. Complete and total segregation. He came face to face with the reality of racist oppression. He came face to face with how capitalism exploited even people in the metropolis. Nkrumah went to an all-African school in Pennsylvania, Lincoln University. As a student in America, Kwame Nkrumah faced many hardships. There was a point when Kwame Nkrumah didn't have any place to sleep. He used to sleep in the park, he used to eat leftovers. Kwame Nkrumah slept in different people's houses. He washed dishes. He scrubbed floors, you know, to eat, to have a place to live and study. And that's, that's how he moved about. That's how he moved about. His, his life was very hard. He's working one job and going to two different schools at the same time. But I think the positive of it was that it put him in contact with the African community in the United States who were oppressed. He had an opportunity to do a survey where he was able to go from house to house and learn from the direct experience of the African people. Kwame Nkrumah went to school to prepare himself for a great struggle ahead. He knew he was very conscious of why he was there. And this, I think, sets him apart from a lot of students that had been there. He did enormous amount of reading um, in his own time. Um, and some of the thinkers that he came across and he remarks in his autobiography are individuals such as Descartes, Schopenhauer, Nietzsche's, Marx, and of course the key influential person he mentions that had a major influence upon him was Marcus Garvey. Nkrumah was to say that we prefer self-government in danger to servitude in tranquility. And I believe it is these influences of people like Garvey that informed such statements. Marcus Garvey had the largest Pan-African organization past or present. And his slogan was simple, Africa for the Africans, those at home and those abroad. Kwame Nkrumah made it very clear that the Honorable Marcus Garvey was one of the main persons who actually, you know, raised his consciousness when he read the book, Philosophy and Opinion of Marcus Garvey. Um, that ignited his Pan-Africanism and his commitment to the African continent. Pan-Africanism, properly defined, is the total liberation and unification of Africa under an all-African socialist government. Pan-Africanism was a movement, a movement which arose out of Africa's unequal and unfair relationship with the rest of the world. Because at that time, every square inch of Africa, except for Ethiopia, was under direct colonial rule. Pan-Africanism is an ideology which unites the African people wherever they may be 
in the struggle for their liberation from exploitation and oppression. The first four Pan-Africanist Congresses were held in uh, the U.S. and in Europe and were not attended by Africans born on the continent. So this is what Kwame Nkrumah experienced, you know, during his time in the U.S. When he was not in school, he was busy moving about the United States, working with local organizations and national organizations like the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. He participated in many debates uh, in Harlem about Pan-Africanism. Attending Garveyite meetings, attending meetings across the ideological spectrum within American politics as well. And Krumer formed his own organization while he was in the United States, which then published a newspaper called The African Interpreter. And that was talking about the need for African unity. He came in contact with a man by the name of C. L. R. James, who was a brother born in Trinidad. He was a revolutionary who followed the socialist ideas of Leon Trotsky, who at least defended the uh, liberation of Africa, the liberation of all the world with socialism. In the 1930s, he hasn't got his driving license yet. He's a young man, an inexperienced man in the United States. He's meeting some of the right people. He's going to the right meetings, he's reading the right books for an active career in, in anti-colonial politics. And he hits, uh, he hits the ground running in, in, in the early 1940s when he arrives in Britain. Nkrumah came to London um, from 1945 and stayed here till 1947. Uh, awful London. I mean, a London where the lights went out all the time because of uh, power outages, uh, people were cold. These are Africans living in London where there's no real heating. It's before the, the days of central heating. Uh, one, one burner gas cookers in the rooms. Uh, rationing, of course, still going on. Um, being wet and cold the whole time. And Krumah decided to come to England it is CLR who introduced him to George Padmore. He knew everybody who was politically active anywhere at all, absolutely everybody. And of course this became quite important when Nkrumah got involved with him because and Padmore could introduce him to everybody. He contributed a lot towards Nkrumah's vision of Pan-Africanism in particular. And Krumah, in his years in the United States and in Britain, was under surveillance. Why would the CIA have had him under surveillance? Well, he was a black man talking about the need for racial equality and against imperialism, which would not have gone unnoticed by the CIA. Padmore, Du Bois and others were in the forefront also of the anti-colonial struggle and they were also in the forefront of the struggle for socialism for newly emergent nations in Africa. So when Nkrumah comes here, he is under surveillance. I would imagine from the time he spoke at the Manchester Pan-African Conference in 1945, I think everybody who spoke there was under surveillance. In 1945, there was Fifth Pan-African Congress in Manchester, England, and the significance of this particular Congress is that you had representatives from the African continent there. A significant historical gathering of West Indians and Africans um, who came from all over the colonial world. Um, over 200 delegates were represented at the Congress and they demanded an end to colonial rule. It was co-chaired by Kwame Nkrumah, Dr. W.B. Du Bois and George Padmore. Pan-Africanism really only began to talk about colonial freedom at this conference. There were Pan-African conferences before, but mostly they were focused on racial inequalities. They didn't say we want independence now. Indeed, the final resolution of the Fifth Pan-African Congress in Manchester declared that Africans needed to struggle against colonialism and to establish newly independent states under the banner of socialism. The people of the Gokos were not ruling themselves. They had representatives of 
the Queen of uh, England, ruling through her governor. I mean, that was direct colonial rule. I mean, there was no significant infrastructure. The only infrastructure that was here was, of course, roads from the mines, you know, to the port. Nkrumah returned to the Gold Coast in 1947 as a result of an invitation by the United Gold Coast Convention, otherwise known as the UGCC, to take up the appointment as secretary for this new organisation. This has been noted as a, a young, clever young man. And he's invited back to be the gopher for the United Gold Coast Convention, which in many senses is the first political party in, in Ghana. He was quite suspicious of the leadership of the United Gold Coast Convention because this leadership was made up of um, representatives of the privileged classes and Nkrumah doubted their commitment to what he would consider to be independence. He found them amateurish. He compared with what he'd seen in terms of political organization in London. He found them uh, undirected, that they were part-time politicians. They were more interested in making money uh, than in politics. Uh, they had personal reasons for being political. Well, here again, it's, it's important to recognize that the colonialists had deliberately created an African class who believed in the ideology and believed in the colonial enterprise. This African elite class was interested in ending colonialism, but ending colonialism only to the extent that they assumed the power of the colonialists and continued to maintain the colonial structures. He builds a party within the party of trusted people uh, who have uh, links with all the other units of disaffection in, in, in the Gold Coast, the so-called voluntary associations, and these are all sorts of scholars' unions, market women's associations, and he builds links with them, and that's very brilliantly done. As Nkrumah was talking about uh, independence now, the opposing forces were saying, no, we don't need that now. We should struggle for independence at some, at, at some future date. The youth and the grassroots identified with Nkrumah was the privileged classes were trying to just hold them back and also trying to get Nkrumah to, to tone down. He then challenges the involvement of United Gold Coast Convention politicians with the Commission of Inquiry into the riots of, of uh, February 1948, the Watson Commission, and the, particularly their involvement in the, the, the Kusi Committee that drafts the new constitution. Their involvement in that is a death knell for them. They're involved with the colonial state in making another colonial constitution. And he denounces them, and he's in a perfect position to do that. He does it very, very cleverly. The pressure from the youth and the grassroots was said that in 1949, Nkrumah broke away from the United Gold Coast Convention and set up the Convention People's Party. On June 12, 1949, he formally launched the Convention People's Party at West End Arena, Accra here. And the party was formed and was born. And all of us registered at me. And right away, of course, there was, uh, there was antagonism on the side of the UGCC, aligning themselves with Europe, while Kwame Nkrumah was aligning himself with the masses of the people in Ghana. The Convention People's Party, or CPP, was created as a vehicle to bring emancipation to the local people of the Gold Coast at that time. No oppressor abandons oppression as a gift to the oppressed. I have not heard of it anywhere in the world. Colonialism is not a tea party. Colonialism is tough. Colonialism is wicked. And colonialism is oppression. And so when you want to get yourself out of this, it's a struggle. You can't get out of it just by passing resolutions and smiling, making good speeches. You have to fight. And you have to remove the oppressor. And if you don't fight to remove the oppressor, the oppressor will even recruit people internally and they'll continue acting on behalf of the oppressor throughout. The campaign for positive action that Nkrumah's Convention People's Party pursued uh, was a strategy very much influenced by Gandhian philosophy and principles. It was a strategy of non-violence and civil disobedience. While Nkrumah was calling for positive action, you know, the strikes, 
uh, the demonstration and stuff. The other people were calling him a troublemaker and a rabble rouser. Which then gives the colonial state the excuse for banging up lots of people for inciting an illegal strike. He's banged up. And of course, it's absolutely perfect that he's banged up as a, this is his first period of martyrdom. Nkrumah spent 14 months in James Fort Prison in Accra. And he plays this to the limit, and he knows enough about Gandhi and, and so on. You know, this is a clever, a clever and a useful thing to do. Meanwhile, the work of the party, which has already been put in train as a well-oiled machine, is going on outside. He wrote letters that he wrote on toilet paper that were smuggled out of the prison and carried to his right-hand lieutenant, Komla Gebedema. The legislation at that time did not prevent him from contesting as a parliamentary candidate. And it became clear at a point in time when the colonial government agreed that constitutional rule for Ghana was going to begin, that Nkrumah was also going to stand. And it then comes to the first general election that Ghana has ever had in, in 1951, which is contested by his political party, the Convention of People's Party, although he's still in the nick. He stands for Accra Central and overwhelmingly wins the seat. England was forced to allow there to be a referendum of independence of staying with colonial rule, in, and the CPP won landslide victory. And under that pressure, he's released by, by, by the governor. And because the Convention People's Party won more seats than anybody else, they are asked to, fa to form the first African government in the Gold Coast, along with colonial officials. The election was met with enthusiasm and excitement everywhere, everywhere in the African world. I mean, Ghana had become now the black star of the world. I mean, everybody looked to Ghana. The British were very clever about it. He should have been prime minister, but they decided you know, for their own purposes, that he shouldn't be prime minister, but leader of government business. And the British come out of this thinking he's a really good guy, and this is a really smart party that compared with all the other guys who'd been political leaders before, this guy delivers the goods. He's a good politician. He's not just a politician, such a statesman. It is my earnest and confident belief that my people in Ghana will go forward in freedom and justice in unity among themselves. On the 6th of March 1957, Kwame Nkrumah became Ghana's first Prime Minister of an independent state. The Gold Coast now became Ghana. Ghana was the first country in Sub-Saharan Africa to obtain independence. And so therefore he was an inspiration to an entire continent to arise and seek their own freedom from the shackles of colonialism. At long last, the battle has ended. Ghana, your beloved country, is free forever. Freedom! 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 Kwame Nkrumah was a visionary, a revolutionary, and a pathbreaker. He dared to challenge colonial subjects and the colonial powers so that ordinary African people could organize for their independence. 
At long last, the battle has ended. He had a vision, he had a dream about Ghana. He broke with the past of bourgeois, uh, gradualist, nationalist politicians. We dedicate ourselves not only in the struggle to emancipate all the territories in Africa. Our economies of European nations. He was born to parents who were not particularly endowed in terms of their wealth. The father was a goldsmith and the mother was a petty trader. He is slightly difficult to pin down. He's, he's an Nzima. His dad comes from the Ivory Coast. His mother comes from just the right side of the Ghanaian border. So he's genuinely on the periphery in ethnic terms. He's on the periphery in class terms. He's on the periphery. Our independence is meaningless unless it's linked up the total reflection of the African continent. Kwame <laughs> Nkrumah was the greatest pan-Africanist and socialist revolutionary organizer that the African world has seen. And if the masses of the people pick up on his ideas, Africa will be free. Kwame was born 21st September 1909 in a town called Ngrofu in the western region of Ghana. Kwame Nkrumah grew up in a colony ruled by the British. There was a governor general and there was a legislative council dominated by colonial commercial interests. The country existed for the export of raw materials that would serve the industries 